Before I start today, a request to bigger YouTubers. Please get new sponsors so I can make fun of them. I have only so many fake VPN ads in me. Today we're starting a new series called Stealing is Normal. I won't explain that title in this video, you gotta stick around. Suffice it to say, the history of stealing runs parallel to the history of creating wealth. And if we don't learn about them together, we might continue to believe stealing is wrong under any circumstances, when in fact, usually, we look the other way. This series will help you pare away the propaganda and recognize theft for what it is. I named this video Evil is the Root of All Money. Usually, I hate using the word evil in any context. It doesn't really describe anything. It just tells us what the speaker considers unequivocally wrong, or at least what they want us to think they think. It's rhetoric. You should always be careful with rhetoric. I just thought my way was a more accurate way of putting the saying. When people talk about wealth, they almost never talk about how that wealth was created, where it came from, and what the people who control it did to acquire it. But if you, if you had to use the term evil, you might define it as cruelty, unnecessary violence, that kind of thing. Tell me if you think the word evil could reasonably be applied to any of the following situations. First, slavery. Is slavery evil? How many people who got rich off slavery gave back any of their wealth? But slavery creates huge amounts of wealth for owners. Where is it all? Could evil describe criminalizing self-sufficiency in Britain a couple hundred years ago? How bad would it have to be to be evil? What if the states started executing people for poaching? Because they did. Could the word be used to describe exporting food from Ireland while locals were starving, leading to about a million deaths? How about colonialism in the Americas, Africa, and Asia, which enslaved and killed hundreds of millions of people? What about wars to expand the territory available for slave plantations, like many of the U.S.'s wars of the 19th century? Or to impose dictatorships that would privatize resources, the focus of U.S. foreign policy in the 20th century? How about jailing and killing workers for going on strike? Children working all day in mines and factories? Could evil describe any of these examples? because they're all part of the history of the creation of wealth. What they produced was turned into wealth, and all that wealth still exists. The system that forced them to labor is still in place. We're all trapped in the effects of this history. And this history is the topic of this video. After all, how are you supposed to understand the present if you don't understand the past? And if you know the history of wealth, you might know that all these things, the slavery, the wars, the child labor, the executions, are not aberrations, but part of a toolbox powerful people can use to get their way. War is just imposing policies with the military instead of the police. Slavery is just cheap labor. You gotta beat up striking workers and forest defenders and give them harsh, punish, uh, harsh punishments and prison sentences, or kill them and smear them in the press, or else others might follow their example. Under capitalism, the political economic system we suffer from, everything we consider evil is part of a range of options or tools powerful people can choose from when they want more. To ask where money and wealth came from is to look at how these tools have been employed to create rich and poor classes. The earliest state formations were probably simple slavery. 
like all states, they would have established a territory, enslaved the people in that territory, and forced them to bring food and build stuff for them. In doing so, they created classes. The lower class, the ruled, did all the work, and the rulers did all the owning. As these states grew, the ones that didn't get destroyed sought out new forms of oppression, like propaganda about an afterlife and cosmic justice. One of the tools they invented was money. As I've explained in my video on the state, states or external rule or involuntary governance or social hierarchy or whatever you want to call it, states have always been imposed on the people. Contrary to popular myth, they've never been voluntary decisions of a population that just wanted to start following someone else's laws for some reason. All of them are imposed on the people. States force us to use money. I'll explain that part more in the next video. But for now, where did money come from? There aren't a lot of written records on the origins of money since it was thousands of years ago. But European empires imposed states, money, and global markets on people all around the world in the past couple hundred years, and we do have records of how they did it, through taxation. Basically, they went somewhere with an army and said, you people we don't know are all now in debt to us. You can pay it back in labor. In this way, they forced everyone they could find to work for them, make money, and pay the money back as taxes. If they didn't work enough to make the wage they had to pay back, they got punished. How many people were enslaved and died this way so a few people could make huge fortunes? And where is all that wealth today? David Graeber's Debt to the First 5,000 Years is the most authoritative resource I know of to explain the origin of money. He starts by debunking the idea of a barter economy. If you've ever taken an economics class, you might have seen a thought experiment that went something like this. Uh, Darren, or maybe some caveman name like Ugg, grows apples. Alicia, or Wug <laughs> makes bread. They want to trade, but Alicia doesn't like apples. What are they to do? They invent money, so now everyone has tokens of value they can exchange for goods and services, and our supply and distribution problems are solved. Problem is that that's an entirely ahistorical account. You know, a myth. There's no record anywhere of a barter economy that developed before money was introduced. You could read another Graeber book, The Dawn of Everything, to see what kind of arrangements ancient people came up with instead, but it wasn't barter. The only time we know of barter being the norm is between strangers or enemies. And yet the myth of primordial barter gets used to justify the modern capitalist economy, with which it has nothing in common. The huge inequalities of wealth we see today are explained away as simply an effect of some people working harder and smarter a long time ago or today, and others just not taking the initiative. Stealing is wrong, we learn, because you're taking from someone who legitimately owns something, presumably because they had to work hard to get it, while if you want something, you should work hard to get it. When you put it that way, the morality of the situation is obvious. Of course you shouldn't steal bread from poor Alicia when she spent all that time making it. But the world's a little more complicated than that. And this account is simply not borne out by history. Here's an account with evidence behind it. Rulers created money, then forced everyone to pay taxes in that currency. That way, people were forced to acquire it from people who had it. So they had to do something for those people or else get punished. Let us take a hypothetical example. Say a king wishes to support a standing army of 50,000 men. 
Under ancient or medieval conditions, feeding such a force was an enormous problem. Unless they were on the march, one would need to employ almost as many men and animals just to locate, acquire, and transport the necessary provisions. On the other hand, if one simply hands out coins to the soldiers and then demands that every family in the kingdom was obliged to pay one of those coins back to you, one would, in one blow, turn one's entire national economy into a vast machine for the provisioning of soldiers, since now every family, in order to get their hands on the coins, must find some way to contribute to the general effort to provide soldiers with things they want. Markets are brought into existence as a side effect. This is a bit of a cartoon version, but it is very clear that markets did spring up around ancient armies. Taxation isn't just how the state funds itself. Taxation is the state forcing us to use money and forcing us to work to get money. But it's even more than that. Taxes integrate us into a global market. In Madagascar, the conquering general Gallieni imposed a head tax on everyone. Not only was this tax quite high, it was also only payable in newly issued Malagasy francs. In other words, Gallieni did indeed print money and then demand that everyone in the country give some of that money back to him. The easiest ways to pay back the debt was either to find some kind of cash crop to sell to start growing coffee or pineapples, or else to send one's children off to work for wages in the city or on one of the plantations that French colonists were establishing across the island. The whole project might seem no more than a cynical scheme to squeeze cheap labor out of the peasantry, and it was that, but it was also something more. The colonial government w was also quite explicit at least in their own internal policy documents, about the need to make sure that peasants had at least some money of their own left over, and to ensure that they became accustomed to the minor luxuries, parasols, lipstick, cookies, available at the Chinese shops. It was crucial that they develop new tastes, habits, and expectations, that they lay the foundations of a consumer demand that would endure long after the conquerors had left and keep Madagascar forever tied to France. Graeber then traces the history of the idea that we owe some debt to society to be paid through taxes and that the debt could be paid off, well, maintained through work. We don't use the same arguments for taxation and debt anymore, we're not paying sun gods to protect us from eclipses, but the democratically elected representatives of the nation and its values. But it's still assumed that we owe something. We still say a criminal owes a debt to society, and as you know, unless we pay our taxes, that's exactly what we become. So we work. And that brings us to how wealth is created. If I owned mines or cultivated land, would I make more money, do you think, hiring wage laborers or by enslaving people to do the work? As many of today's biggest corporations can tell you, slavery is quite lucrative. But any and every business takes the product of the worker's labor, which they sell, and part of the revenue goes to the owners. The less owners have to give back in wages, or say, cleaning up the soil, water, and sky after they've poisoned them, the more of this wealth they keep for themselves. Slavery of African and other people in the Americas created, by today's standards, trillions of dollars in wealth. That wealth hasn't disappeared. It's still kicking around, just in different hands. It's gone to finance more ventures, to help rich people get richer, while never really trickling down to the people creating it. Modern day slavery has the same effect. But in an age where slavery is kind of illegal, how does a corporation extract ever more wealth from consumers? After all, laws and norms haven't changed. Your job is still to help the stock price at any cost. Well, you could raise prices and pass it off as the incidental process of inflation. And if you're like every other company, you've already thought about that. 
You could get the state to pass regulations outlawing the competition, or just straight up subsidies like these. Again, very common. But don't worry, there are lots of other ways to feed people to your bottom line. Remember I said slavery was kind of illegal? Well, that's more if you're a private citizen. For a corporation, the system practically encourages it. Modern-day slavers take advantage of the legal loophole of states that don't enforce policies on large corporations. If illegal slavery leaves a bad taste in your mouth, you could try prison labor. Again, many other corporations have benefited from this money-saving tip. Here's a great idea for the modern-day plantation owner. You could criminalize migration, then hire criminalized workers and pay them whatever you want, and treat them however you want because they have no legal recourse. Again, you just have to know about the obscure legal loophole of no one with power caring enough to do anything about it. So it's funny to me when people say things like, the rich create jobs. Yeah, they do. but. What that means is they have so much money, acquired somehow, don't ask how, that they can use some of it to get people to work all day to make them more money. Saying they create jobs is like saying they have money, but thinking they should get credit for it rather than scrutiny. Nobody likes jobs. Nobody likes having to follow orders and work all day. We do it because the system forces us to. Our supposed debt to the state keeps us coming back. But we don't learn about any of this in history class, which makes little connection between the past and the present, and never talks about the economic system, or economics class, where we learned every corporation pays the correct market wage. No one ever attempts to explain to us where our food, clothes, and electronics come from, they just say, oh yeah, from Asia. We don't talk about how things are made to fall apart, so we have to buy new copies every few years. We don't talk about why we have classes of rich and poor. Everyone just has different amounts of wealth for some reason. I'm going to go into other parts of the history of wealth and poverty in other videos on this playlist. Knowing the history of wealth and how it's created undermines our assumptions regarding property and ownership. Any arguments implying the distribution of wealth is fair, or could be fair, or that anyone and everyone can get rich, or capitalism is somehow meritocratic do not take history into account. If someone's rich, you can ask why, and what the effects are. People argue whether or not the story of Elon's dad owning an emerald mine in South Africa is true, but it doesn't matter. He made a bunch of money under apartheid, somehow. Elon grows up comfortable, doesn't need to struggle, can screw up and lose money, and there's always something to fall back on. When you own stuff in a capitalist system, getting rich is simply a matter of hiring enough people who need your money to survive. If you're asking what we should do about all this, the inequality, the cruelty, the slavery, great! That's the subject of this video and one or two others. But in brief, we should take it back. All of it. Everything owned for power or profit should become common available and accessible to everyone.